Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, banker to consultant shares his path from a target school in the Midwest to a bulge bracket investment banking analyst role in New York. Learn how he was able to make a transition from the FIG group in New York to the technology group in San Francisco, and why he moved back to India for a strategy and business development role a year before applying for top MBAs. Listen to hear the reasons he thinks he was able to get into a top three MBA, as well as why he chose to go to one of the top consulting firms coming out of school. Enjoy. Okay, banker turned consultant. Welcome to the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Hey, Patrick. Thanks for having me. So it'd be great if you could just give the listeners a short summary. Sure. So I'm originally from India. Uh, I moved to the U.S. for college. I went to a target school in the Midwest. Uh, I was an econ major there. Um, after college, I spent a few years at a bulge bracket investment bank on Wall Street was in New York for a couple of years uh, covering FIG, then moved to SF, to the Global Technology Group with the same firm. After that, I spent uh, a couple of years uh, back in India in a business development and strategy role at a large conglomerate, then went back to the US for business school. And now finally, I'm a consultant at uh, a top three consulting firm in New York. So I've moved around a lot, and I'm one of those uh, rare breeds who went from banking to consulting. For sure, super interesting background. I think you've hit a lot of different uh, different types of roles that our that our users or our listeners are interested in hearing about. So let's start all the way back. Um, even before undergrad, I guess. Did you you grew up? Did you grow up in India, or where were you? Um... Yep. I so I was born and raised in India. Grew up here. Uh, went to high school here, um, and in fact. High school was where I got my first uh, taste of kind of the business world, if you will. Um, I, I took uh, an econ course uh, in the 11th and 12th grade. Um, and so, you know, micro macroeconomics, understanding a little bit about interest rates and inflation and monetary policy, fiscal policy, which, which then sort of translated into my major in college. And, and we'll obviously talk more about that, I'm sure. Was it something that you loved right off the bat in high school? Or you were just like, this is weird? Or what was the thought process? You know, I, I did. I, for some reason, I, well, not for some reason. My, my father is a commercial banker, and he has worked in kind of risk management and credit on the banking side. And so um, ever since I, I was able to start speaking intelligently to some of what he did, or at least talk about, hey, this is what's gonna to happen to inflation, right? Like if you lower interest rates, I think that kind of made me uh, a little bit more um, excited about the, the future prospects of, of going down um, that sort of path, or at least studying economics more um, in college. So tell me about the thought process of coming to the US for college. How, how did that work out? You know, you're coming in an interesting time. Yeah, I... I I actually, I remember vividly that uh, I joined, I started uh, at school uh, two days before uh, Lehman went bankrupt. Uh, and I, I had no idea what was going on, just by the way. So it's not like you, you would be expected to know any of that uh, as, a, uh, as a first year in college, uh, even if you ultimately end up in finance. But uh, the decision was driven by, uh, on the one hand, kind of, you know, obviously I, I wanted to study, I, I thought I wanted to major in economics and I, I went to a top school uh, with a great economics program. But on the other hand, I also liked the idea of being in a liberal arts environment and really broadening my horizons to topics and subjects and fields outside of what it is that I would major in, which is not necessarily the way the Indian educational system or, or the British um, uh, educational system, which was another option I was considering, not how they work. Was that because your what did your dad believe in that or your mom believe in that the liberal arts education? I'm just curious. No, actually, a couple of my they they were very much in in favor of me kind of 
uh, going to either the UK or, or staying back in India, but it was some of my cousins and aunts and uncles in the US that, uh, that sort of pitched what liberal arts and what studying in the US and, and interacting with people from you know, tens and hundreds of different countries, what that all does to you. And, and that convinced me uh, and eventually convinced them. Very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not too common. So, okay, so you came over here, you're, you know, what's the thought process in terms of like investment banking and when did that come on the horizon? Was it like not until your sophomore year, junior year? Did you always know freshman year where you're like, I'm going to be an investment banker? How did it, how did it work? No. So uh, freshman year was very much about uh, adjusting to life in the U.S. and the culture shock and, and figuring out uh, whether I wanted to uh, focus on a career that was uh, sort of directly uh, in line with um, economics. So say if I wanted to do research or go down the grad school or PhD path, and I, while I was fascinated by, by macro, um, I soon realized that that was not something that that I wanted to pursue. So it was more my second year when I started to uh, look at a natural adjacency to economics, which is finance, and kind of expose myself more to the field uh, by actively reading uh, financial newspapers more, uh, joining a finance club on campus, talking to a couple of uh, peers and seniors, and just sort of immersing myself more in, in what that's all about. Uh, that first piqued my curiosity, and then I started thinking about, okay, you know, how do I actually get uh, firsthand exposure to, um, uh, to, to finance and, and the finance world? Um, I, I then, at the end of my, my sophomore year, um, I knew I was coming back to India for uh, the summer, potentially my last summer back in India, which it turned out to be. And so I wrote to a couple of um, India offices of um, a couple of the, the Wall Street banks. And, and as it happens, one of them had sort of an unpaid externship program for their Asia offices. And, and uh, through that, I was able to at least get exposed to investment banking uh, and see what, what it was all about. Sounds like the perfect kind of sophomore summer to get it on your resume and going to junior recruiting with a little something on there. So was it- yep, uh, a little something. Yeah, a little something, at least have the name <laughs> on there, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so you were able to kind of get something your sophomore summer back in India. And then when you came back to campus, what was it was recruiting heating up right away for junior for junior summer? Yeah. So uh, interestingly, I spent my full uh, term of my junior year studying abroad. So I wasn't on campus and I didn't think that was a major issue at the time. But uh, clearly, I missed out on a lot of the info sessions and networking events. And so in hindsight, I would have, I, I love study abroad, but I would have done it an, another uh, term, uh, maybe maybe the spring. Uh, so I actually, when I came back in, in the winter, um, I didn't really get a chance to network much, though I did reach out to uh, a few seniors and their friends and really tried to delve into their experiences as, as interns and get some interview tips and tricks. And uh, in terms of the application I applied, because I was at a target school, I applied through the standard on-campus recruiting process, um, and kind of that's what um, that was. What like December time? December time frame, or that was January. January. Okay, so there were still some openings, and you applied. Do you remember how many applications or how many places you applied to, and around how many first-round interviews you got? Sure. So, so that was actually when a lot of the applications were due. You literally came back to campus, and boom, there were all these resume cover letter drops. I think I might have applied to about 10 or 11 um, and I landed two interviews. Two interviews, yeah. So the conversion wasn't great, you think, because of that, you were gone that, that fall? I think that had uh, a role to play. Your GPA, was your GPA high? My GPA was uh, pretty solid. It was a, uh, about a 3.6, uh, which, which at my school was, was pretty good. Yeah, there's not a lot of great inflation yet in there. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. So... But yeah, I think it was that I had a couple of alternates, um, and, but then, yeah, most of them didn't actually um, turn into interview invites. So you only had two in first round interviews. Was, was it were you nervous at that point? I, I sure was. Uh, I, I knew that, I mean, it was, uh, it was a blessing and a curse because I knew that, okay, this is, uh, these, are, these are the only two shots that I have um, if, I, if I wanted to do investment banking specifically. Uh, I did have an interview uh, for uh, credit risk at 
at a large bracket, but I wanted to do investment banking. And so I was, I was nervous. Um, and um, I think what, what happened was my, my first process, therefore I was, I was a little rusty, I was nervous. Um, I kind of had in the back of my mind that, that I have to get one or both of these. Uh, and so uh, the interview went okay, um, the, the, the interviews, um, but it didn't convert. Yeah, so tell me, like, to that first round interview at the first first bank, were they both bulge bracket banks? They were both bulge bracket banks. So the first bulge bracket bank you interviewed at, um, you're there, first round interview. What you said, you're a little rusty, a little nervous. So how? What do you mean by that? Like you're stumbling a little bit in your answers in terms of yeah, why? Yeah, I banking? was fumbling. I was fumbling in my exactly. I was fumbling in. Uh, it was it was largely behavioral, just a little bit of technical. I I fumbled a lot in the behavioral. I think I was just overwhelmed um honestly in the moment and uh it was it was for uh, a regional office of a of a bulge bracket investment bank and i think somewhere in there I, I also kind of hinted at the fact that i was really excited to work in new york uh <laughs> and so yeah uh that that i don't, I don't think that point necessarily uh was was well taken um but but it turned out to be a great learning experience i mean i don't think i completely bonded i it was great practice. Uh, not that you necessarily want uh, one of your two interviews to be uh, a just... practice opportunity, but it turned out to be a blessing. Same thing happened to me. Same thing happened to me. The only offer I converted was one of the last ones, and I can't because I had gone through so many others. Yeah, you just get a lot better. Exactly. So okay, so tell me about that second that second one. So you didn't. So you had the first round interview. Did you not get a second round on that one? Yeah, I didn't get a second round on that one. Okay, and so then the the next one is how many days later? The next one was a couple of days later. Okay, so were you just studying and-, and I was just, yeah, just nonstop uh, focusing on the areas where I fumbled and just really refining, sharpening my answers, reviewing the vault guide. Uh, there was this other 100, 200, 400 question, question bank. You didn't use the you didn't use the IB uh, the the WSO interview courses? Back then, I, I did not. I unfortunately did not. I, I wish I had. It's all but, good. Uh, I, yeah. No. So, so yeah, I'm just teasing you. So like the, um, I guess my question is you only had a couple of days there. Were you spending most of your time? Cause I think a lot of people find themselves in this similar situation where they think they're ready. They get into the first one they get punched in the face, fall down. They're like, Oh my gosh, I have to do a lot more prep. And suddenly they only have a few days to kind of get polished. So were you spending a lot of times doing mock interviews with your friends at all? No. So at that point, I mean, it was too little time to do mock interviews. So I just focused on, I mean, I, I honed in on the questions in the question banks and obviously the notes that I had prepared uh, where I knew I uh, was not totally kind of secure. How did you, how did you know what, what were those questions and how did you know you weren't doing a good job on them? Because when I had practiced them before the first interview, they weren't perfect. And uh, in a couple of cases, they weren't perfect uh, in that interview as well. Just brushing up on my resume, specifically the investment banking internship. Um, you mean not perfect in the sense of like how you delivered them or not perfect in the sense of like the actual content? A little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's like even now, I mean, there's always, even if you know the content, uh, sometimes you, you're just sort of in the moment and, and you might forget. So it's a little bit of the content. And then of course, it's also, the delivery uh, when when there's two kind of bankers, senior bankers staring at you um, in a small room. So I think it it was both. But what what also helped me um, just on the same point was that for whatever reason I just went in um, with a much more kind of optimistic and positive frame of mind into the second uh, interview process uh, and. Honestly, that helped in the first round of the second bank as well as the the final round super day. So let's t let's talk about that. So you, you first round you come in, they're asking you all the standard behaviorals. You know why investment banking? Why this bank? You were ready to go. You you delivered it. How did you not sound so rehearsed? How did you not sound rehearsed? Had you practiced the just the sweet spot amount where like you didn't write out all your answers? You had like yeah I yeah I did, and I think honestly it just part of it was just it for whatever reason didn't feel as rehearsed as as it probably did when I was in my room. And I uh as I mentioned earlier, when I had those conversations with 
uh, those those seniors and 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 their friends who were who were recent first years, uh, because I couldn't network when I was when I was away. Um, I, I had run some of my answers by them. This was before the the first bank process, and so I kind of tried to focus on okay, what is it that they said? Like, how do I make sure that I deliver it in a, in a in a particular way, knowing kind of what I know about myself, obviously, um, and just not um, kind of sound wishy-washy uh so uh and and I, I will say lastly that uh it's also kind of the energy that you feed off of the the interviewer and the first round was with someone who i just instantly hit it off with and so it that that also made it made it a lot easier and then then in, with the second round the, the super day um i think i was just a lot more confident than because the first round uh went well were you flown in for the super day no, so uh, they flew the the two uh, MDs from New York uh, flew to where I was to our campus. Very cool. And so you you were there, and the Super Day. You find out you get the Super Day, and now the pressure is kind of ramped up. Did it switch anything? Was there anything unique about the Super Day or uh, surprising about the Super Day in terms of like, or is it the same kind of behavioral questions repeated, or were there kind of new questions, a lot you know harder technicals, anything like that, or was it more softballs because they're MDs? No, actually, it was so the two MDs played good cop, bad cop. Uh, one of them. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> yeah. So for the listeners, good cop, bad cop means one person is acting angry or annoyed or disinterested, and the other one's friendly. Exactly. And so uh, I had the bad cop first, and he was also from India. He'd gone to a similar high school. Um, and uh, th this particular bank also asked for your grade transcript. And obviously he was a, a U Chicago uh, grad. And so he looked at my courses. He looked at the harder courses that I took in which I didn't get straight A's, but he called me, nonetheless, he called me out on why I didn't do as well in those courses. He then uh, asked, would randomly ask me, I mean, he, he asked me uh, some more sort of complicated technicals, complicated in relative terms uh, by, by junior, uh, uh, by junior year standards, so you know the the how the um, the three statements connect, uh, how depreciation is reflected, um, what are the different ways to value a company and whatnot. Uh, but then he would like throw in a question uh, on mental math, like just a simple multiplication, uh, or he'd ask me some micro and microeconomics concepts, and it was really just a stress test interview. Um, along with the the why banking and and why that firm and, and strengths and weaknesses and then he questioned he, he questioned my strengths and he really drilled into my weaknesses and and so it it was truly a stress test interview but I think overall I I held my own and and he confirmed that after the fact um, and then the second one was the was was more of a good cop uh, with an MD which felt a lot similar to the uh, first round that I had the previous day more like vibing and you're feeling good and it's like a happy conversation and less of a drill. Yeah, exactly. And you wanted me to feel better after the first Any one. tips for people who are kind of getting grilled by a bad cop? Um, sometimes they put good cop, bad cop in the same room. Have you seen that before in the same interview? I have. That happened to me at Goldman. That happened to me at Goldman when I was just getting grilled by somebody and they're just rolling their eyes. And <laughs> so I was good. So this happened to me when I was a third year analyst uh, interviewing um, an intern or an intern candidate. And I was good cop. So I don't think I can be bad cop. But uh, so I was good cop. And uh, we just decided this like a few minutes before the interview. Yeah, I was not necessarily in favor of it. But so the uh, the colleague of mine was bad cop. And um, I mean, it's. It's one of those situations where you just have to really back yourself. Um, you almost have to, at times, uh, err on the side of being a little too self-assured, uh, because otherwise it can really kind of eat into whatever it is that that you do know or that you are saying. Yeah, they can steamroll you. They want to see how confident you are exactly in terms of your answers. They're pushing you, even though you think you know do you really really know are you super confident in your answer and so they're trying to Especially they're trying if to it's, mm -hmm. if it's something about your background and sort of your fit and behavioral style questions i mean you 
you know who you are, like you know your motivations, you know what you've done, but they will just try and poke holes in it because that's their role. Uh, so you just have to uh, stay your ground and hold your own. Yeah, hold your ground, be respectful, even though they're being uh, jerks potentially. <laughs> exactly, not lose your cool. Really interesting. Um, okay, so you're you're in the final round. You kind of had this good cop, bad cop. You get out of the final interview, and in how long before you find out you have a, a, a junior summer offer? I think it was uh, a couple of days, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, that long? Okay, so it wasn't right away. A few days, um, and I think you said it was with the Fig Group. Mm -hmm. What did you? How did you think about that in terms of? So you got a call, and they say, "Hey, we want you to join the Fig team for the summer." It was your only. It was your only offer. It was only your. It was only your exactly. Offer. So I was. I was going to take it. Yeah. <laughs> regardless, but uh, I mean, they did have this. Uh, this call it like. Get exactly what it was called. Basically, a day where they flew you into New York and you got a chance to kind of interact with people from different groups, uh, and then you submitted your preferences. Um, and and Fig was my third preference. It was my uh, second industry group preference, um, but it, it it was one of the industries that I was interested in, besides tech, which I ultimately ended up at uh, a couple of years down the line. So. Uh, I was excited about, I mean, given my econ background, I feel like, you know, some of the the policy impact on banks and just generally kind of having that flavor in the deals that I worked on um, and sort of the industry trends uh, would be uh, quite interesting. For sure, just the macro, macroeconomic, yeah, the macroeconomic background is important for fake, right? So exactly. Um, okay, so you're you're kind of um, you get the offer. You're now kind of coming into junior summer. What's that internship like? Is it, you know, the hundred hour weeks, ninety hour weeks? Is it, is it something where, uh, is it what you expected, or how was it like? In, was it New York? I assume it was New York. First time ever being, first time ever being in New York. First time ever uh, living in New York. Yep, absolutely. So what was that like? It was uh, everything that it was slated to be. It was, uh, you know, ninety hundred hour weeks, uh, most weeks. Uh, everyone was was getting uh, crushed, as they say, all of the interns. Um, but you know, it it definitely gave me a real taste of what the job was going to be like. Uh, I worked uh, on projects across multiple verticals. Uh, when I when I joined full time, I get placed into a couple of uh, the five or six verticals within Fig. Uh, but I got good exposure to several of them. Um, I really liked the team. I feel like while on the one hand, they were uh, certainly making us work extremely hard, but that's just kind of what the job entails. On the other hand, they were quite supportive. Um, and yeah, I, I got along with uh, with uh, a, a number of my seniors and I felt like it was where I'd want to start my career. So when I got the full-time offer, I uh, I didn't sign on the spot, but I signed pretty soon thereafter. Uh, yeah, in terms of signing on the spot or thereafter, did you ever think of going into full-time recruiting with that offer in hand and trying to leverage it for uh, another offer? Not for another offer in another bank necessarily. I was just trying to see whether there'd be any openings um, in you know the one or two uh, other groups that I was interested in. Like technology? Uh, one of which, M&A and, and the other uh, one, which was tech. Those were both obviously in very high demand, um, and um, so you know it was. It was, I think, you know, one or two people might have moved around, but generally it was very hard to do that um, switch between your uh, internship and and uh, starting full time. So, did you feel nervous about trying to push for that in case of like? Did you feel like, hey, if I push too hard here, they could just rescind my offer? I don't think I was worried about the offer getting rescinded, but I. Uh, was cognizant of the bad blood. You don't want to offend. You don't want to offend the MDs and the. Exactly, I don't want to offend the the people in Fig and and you know ruffle any feathers and especially if the odds of moving were low to begin with. Um, I, I sort of, I just kind of tested the waters um, and soon realized that that it just made sense taking Fig. So you worked really hard um, that summer. Do you feel like um, I don't know if you've seen recently we re released uh, part two of our survey um that came out and 
mostly for the bulge bracket banks, just showing um, how analysts started before. Did you, you saw the Goldman Sachs 13 hey, so I did. Mm -hmm. survey. We just released a more industry-wide survey. Did you see that? I, I didn't see that. Yeah, so it just came out and um, I think it's getting covered by NBC today. It's going to be pretty it's getting, it's getting out there. So it's okay. really, no, I just wanted to get your thoughts on just the, the mental health and what you saw around you. Cause it sounds like you were in a pretty, you were working in a time that was uh, pretty busy, right? The economy was recovering. There was a lot of transactions to do out of the, you know, you're well out of the financial crisis at that point. Um, so tell me a little bit about, you know, once you started there full time, you know, did your analyst class dwindle fast? Was it something where there was a lot of attrition? Um, did you see any mental health issues? Or you, know, you, you personally, how did you handle um, the long hours? Because you were there for over three years. Um, I know you made the transition from New York to SF and from FIG to, to um, technology, but I'd love to hear just how you dealt with it personally. Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of the analyst class, it, it didn't really dwindle. Um, before the two year mark when a lot of people move on. Uh, but, you know, we like for any other typical industry group or, or, or any uh, investment banking group, we um, as an analyst class kind of really bonded together. Uh, we tried to kind of uh, pick people up uh, when the chips were down and a rally. I think in terms of mental health, uh, I I tried to find whatever outlets I could, you know, the, a lot of the standard sort of hobbies that one can pursue uh, in, the, in the little time that one has <laughs> outside of uh, the day-to-day the -day. Uh, friends. I luckily had a lot of friends who had sort of moved to New York to also work in, in finance. Um, and so there were others who I could commiserate with, if you will, even outside of my group. Um, and I... I think I, when you, uh, at least in my group, what I what I liked was that when th there were certain people when where you did uh, reach out to them, or even if you didn't reach out to them, if if it was a really bad week or rough week or rough project, they would really appreciate um, the hard work that you were putting in, and you know try. They wouldn't go out of their way to make your life more miserable, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. and that goes a long way. Uh, in in a job which is going to be um, intense, that that really does make a difference. I mean, there's a lot more that one can do, uh, and we've seen a lot of policy changes that have been uh, put in place over the years. But but that was it. That that was uh, great um, at the time, uh, relatively. It sounds like you were able to handle the stress in the long hours pretty well. Um, and as you're approaching kind of year two, when did you think about this internal transition? How, you know, inter how did you think about potentially leaving the firm and doing a lateral jump versus internally and how to, not to ruffle any feathers again? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I really liked uh, the firm and um, I, I like the people who I worked with. I, I truly didn't want to ruffle any feathers unless I really had to, uh, which, which sort of did um, come up to, to a, a minor happen. extent. Yeah. It did happen um, as I, expressed my interest in, in switching groups. And so um, two of my, I, I started to find myself really developing a strong interest in, a, a stronger interest in technology. Uh, I worked in the FinTech vertical as one of the verticals within FIG um, and, you know, so spent some time in, uh, in, in an area within tech and was, was spending a lot of time outside of work really trying to understand what was going on there. A couple of my seniors had transferred uh, from FIG to tech in SF as it happens uh, in those six to 12 months before I did. And the firm touted its internal mobility as well. So, um, you know, it was, it was something that I'd seen uh, happen and, and something that I knew that if I really pushed for it, that they would hopefully uh, make it work. Um, so I expressed my interest. I told the operating head of FIG that I, that I wanted to move uh, to the SF tech group, but then they kind of dilly dallied. Um, they tried to convince me to move the following year, um, and you know maybe move to a different group first, and, and then move out there. It's in high demand, and so on and so forth. And but I I 
uh, was ready at that point to, to make the move. And I think it was the first time when I really kind of put my foot down and um, almost threatened to, to leave if they didn't uh, let me interview with the SF team within the next, uh, the following couple of weeks. I, I had started looking externally, which is the point that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And um, I, I had just secured an offer from a, uh, a top, um, impact investment fund focused on fintech for the unbanked in Europe. Um, and I was going through a couple other processes as well. Yeah. So you, you knew you were in high demand. You knew that even if they, even if you did have to leave, um, there wasn't a, it wasn't a fake bluff or anything like that. It was a legitimate, legitimate threat of like, Hey, I'm either moving or I'm gone. Yeah. At that point I did have a little bit of leverage. And so yeah. I, uh, for the first time, I think I was, I was more aggressive than I normally was and it worked. Yeah. Um, they, they got me to interview with the global head of, of the technology group the next week, uh, a couple of other MDs, uh, a VP and an associate. And the uh, following month, uh, I was in San Francisco. That's fast. So you did, you did have to stand up for yourself. It's, it wasn't, you know, even for a firm that touts, touts itself as having internal mobility, you can see the struggles internally, politically, how hard it is when there's a group that tends to struggle a little bit more to retain their good talent. Um, to a group that's in high demand, it's still very hard to make that transition. You see the same thing in the big four, people trying to move from audit to transaction advisory services. You see the same thing in, um, all, these in all these banks. And even and to be fair, tech was super hot those two years. Yeah. Uh, so it, tech SF especially. Um, and, and so it, it made sense, but... So talk about that transition. What was it like going from FIG to, to technology? And was it really, was it a hard transition learning curve at all? Or did you kind of just were you able to kind of hit the ground running when you got out to SF? Uh, it was a harder transition than I thought. Uh, I, I was obviously interested in uh, the industry, but it's one thing having immersed yourself in a very specialized uh, world of financial services, looking at you know, price to tangible book and uh, capital ratios and whatnot to a completely different world uh, where, you know, uh, there are different, obviously different business models, different uh, revenue models, a very balance sheet like just a lot of kind of industry knowledge that you had to build up, especially relative to peers of mine who had been there uh, from their uh, first day. Um, and so I, I sort of felt like um, a, a first year analyst all over again, or maybe sort of a rising second year analyst for a little while until I came up the learning curve. Uh, of course, I, I had the technical grounding and I, I knew what the job entailed, but it was um, a, a meaningful transition. Sure. Okay, so you're there for a little over, um, a, little over a year um, in, in San Francisco and you, you get the analyst to associate promote, but when, at what point do you start thinking of um, moving back to, to India and what prompted that move? And what, in, in terms of what types of opportunities were you looking for? Sure. So um, I started thinking about potentially moving back to India uh, around the same time that that uh, I was going to get promoted, going to be communicated uh, the promotion. So around uh, June, July of that year. Okay. Yeah. About eight or nine months into the. Yeah. Nine. Exactly. Nine months, I think, into the stint. Um, and it was because. I mean, I, I, I liked what I was doing. I, I liked banking. That was the reason why I, I stayed for the third year, unlike most analysts. Um, and and I, I loved the tech group and what I was, was learning and doing. But I think the more time I spent in banking, the more I felt like I also wanted to experience uh, how a company makes decisions at the highest levels, uh, you know, not just in relation to finance, but um, also more broadly kind of around strategy and operations. And separately, I was keen on working in the emerging markets, having spent several years in the US. Um, I also had this uh, medium term goal of wanting to go to business school. And so I thought it would be helpful to diversify my experience and my profile a little bit as well. Uh, so that's when I started exploring, um, you know, chief of staff and sort of generalist business roles at startups on the one hand and, you know, large uh, corporates and conglomerates uh, on the other in India. Startups, startups uh, abroad as well? Startups, uh, no, startups also back, back in area. India. 
Oh, India, India. Okay. Back in India. Mm-hmm. So you ended up I taking... felt like I could leverage my Bay Area tech banking experience there, uh, which obviously is, uh, is a great trump card. So you ended up getting a great role as a manager of strategy and business development or office of the chairman uh, for a large conglomerate at, a, at a India. Tell me about that role, how different it was, the day-to-day. So you, you were still probably working 90-ish hour weeks when you were in technology, I assume, <laughs> since it was a hot, it was a hot time. You were doing- Yeah, longer, longer hours on average than I did in fig. Jeez. So it was pretty rough three years, man. Yeah, I, to, to be fair, I think when I, was, when I said uh, 90, FIG was probably closer to 80 on average. Uh, tech was closer to 90, but they were all live deals. FIG had uh, less uh, live deal exposure just given the deal flow for our group at the time. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I was fine, I guess, in some ways working those longer hours, but, but yes. Yeah, okay. So you're looking, you're, think, you're thinking business school, you're thinking diversify my background. Were you worried that you'd be put into the investment banking bucket? And were you worried if you went to private, were you thinking private equity at all? I'm curious why you thought strategy and operations. Yeah, so I, I was obviously exposed to private equity um, as a lot of my peers kind of, you know, uh, look, looked into it and, and went down that path. And it's a great path. Um, but in my case, I didn't actively, consciously work towards it or pursue it. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I came to realize that I really liked uh, banking. I, was, I, was, I felt like I was learning a lot. I liked working with um, uh, a, a wide range of companies of you know, different levels of maturity uh, on an m and deal, on, a, on an IPO, debt, equity, financial advisory, often at the same time. Um, and and you know, I, I knew kind of the, the pros uh, um, and I guess to some extent the cons of going into private equity. And I, I didn't feel particularly compelled uh, to actively make the move um, I would have probably just sort of jumped on the bandwagon if I, if I had uh, gone through that process. That's fair. Okay, so you're, you land this new job in Mumbai and you're kind of moving back near closer to home. I don't know if your family's from Mumbai, the area, but you're, you're kind of moving back closer to home. Tell me a little bit about what the day-to-day, how different it was from technology, investment banking to strategy and operation. I mean, I'm sure it was super different, um, but... Tell me about yeah, in, in some ways it was it was very different, uh, just in terms of you know how larger corporate organizations work. Uh, and this was a role where I was uh, at the holding company, um, so kind of working closely with uh, a number of different uh, group portfolio companies on uh, strategic initiatives, on uh, operational support that they might have needed, and some you know group level. Uh, projects, special projects, quote unquote, that we were trying to implement. Um, And so uh, when it came to matters at the group level that we were going to roll out across different portfolio companies, I think those were generally easier to push through. We were a small team. We were the office of the chairman. Uh, It it was, you know, high profile, high visibility um, unit. But when it came to working with uh, the operating companies across different uh, industries that, that the conglomerate had interests in, uh, there it was a lot uh, more kind of high touch in some ways. You know, there's a lot of stakeholder management that, that has to happen. Even if you are ultimately the holding company, you're working with uh, senior leadership. Uh, you are a uh, quasi chief of staff, you know, 25 year old. These are industry veterans. And so you have to strike a, a delicate balance when it comes to uh, trying to get their buy-in uh, around what we might have wanted to push them to work on. Can you give an example of like what you were trying to push through to some of these um, leaders? Yeah. So for instance, um, uh, one of the, uh, the areas or clusters um, that this large conglomerate has, uh, um, ha- has companies in is uh, the financial services uh, again. and so. Um, that was part of the reason why that uh, I, I worked closely with those companies in, in that I had a, a, a finance background or financial services big background. Uh, and what they were trying to do is they were trying to really shore up their digital capabilities. So there was that fintech element, which having worked in tech, having done a little bit of fintech was also super fascinating to me. 
um, and an area where I could have added at least a little bit of value or so I thought. Um, and so those were the kinds of conversations that we uh, were having where, you know, we would take stock of where they were in that journey in areas like digital payments, digital lending, insurance, and so on, see if there was a way in which we could maybe develop a unified uh, super app, which allowed customers to access, you know, a whole host of different financial services to a single app. And it's also obviously digitally uh, accessible. Um, but, you know, different companies were at different stages of their journey. Different CEOs uh, had sort of different views of, you know, how they felt about some of those interactions. Um, and uh, oftentimes, you know, the, the, you'd, you'd make a little bit of progress. You would perhaps even identify certain companies in, as I was in business development, I would even identify certain companies that we might have wanted to strategically partner with. But then, you know, there's obviously all the puts and takes of, of establishing those types of partnerships. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, those, I think, incredible learnings um, that were very different from uh, being on the advisory side, uh, but at the same time, uh, challenges, if you will, around um, influencing people, getting buy-in, and, and actually executing, you know, the stuff that you don't necessarily sure. see when you're on the advisory side. For sure. So did this, do you feel like this experience though, even if it was maybe a little frustrating and you couldn't push everything through that you wanted, was, did you feel like it was helpful to differentiate yourself uh, in your business school applications? Oh, it, it absolutely was. Yeah. I mean, there was, I talked about some of the, the differences and, and, you know, maybe to some extent the difficulties around uh, being in that type of a role, but um, it, it was unique. Uh, I was working with you know, the, the um, senior leadership of, of one of India's largest conglomerates, yeah. the chairman and, and, his, and his senior team. Uh, because of that, I uh, had access to and, and was having those types of discussions with uh, the C-suite of the operating companies. And so a lot of high visibility um, projects, a lot of uh, uh, interactions with, with people who obviously have a lot of experience and, and are leaders in their respective fields. Um, and I was able to kind of weave a lot of these softer um, elements and experiences uh, into my application uh, and my interview uh, more so than my application, because that's when it sort of really um, uh, sort of came to, uh, came to light when I could actually speak to some of those experiences beyond just what I was able to include in my written application. So I think that certainly helped me stand apart, or at least uh, I would like to believe it did. What was your GMAT score? <laughs> just kidding. You don't have to share. I, I just, I'm curious, like you, you're coming like, okay, so you're competing by and large with a large base uh, of applicants from India who tend to score incredibly high, right? Um, on average, especially on the math component. Did you feel like, well, obviously you had been in the U.S. for, for a good seven-ish, seven -ish, you know, a good, a good number of years. Do you feel like that helped you as well in terms of just... just yeah, uh, that helped. I, I, got a, I got a high score on the GMAT. Um, I, I did well on both. I, I, I think the, the um, English or, uh, yeah, the English uh, piece was... was uh, easier. I, I attempted it twice, and I think the English piece was was definitely easier for me um, because I had spent right. uh, a lot of time in the U.S. I mean, not that I grew up speaking English, but uh, it, there's just certain nuances that you don't necessarily think about until you're asked to complete a sentence uh, on a on a GMAT test. Right. Um, so so that helped, and my quant was generally strong. So overall, it it went well. Um, and, you know, the beauty of the GMAT is that you, you can you can take it in quick succession if you don't like your first score, which I didn't. So um, it all worked out. In the can end. you tell me how much you jumped on your from your first second? Was it like, you know, 700? 20, 20 points. Okay. So you let me, let me guess, 710 to 730? Or 730 to 750? 720 to 740. So I was close. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you retook at 720. Most people wouldn't do that. 
but you felt like you yeah i felt like i i had a little bit more in me yeah fair so let's talk about business school you get there you're having a great time or do you know immediately hey i want to go consulting or what was the thought process around did you kind of go in knowing what you wanted to recruit for because i know for for business school as soon as you get there it's almost like recruiting starts within a few months right or even if the first month the networking sessions and all that so did you kind of go in knowing uh not quite to be very honest with you i went in wanting to um go even closer to the front lines of uh of uh, business operations so from kind of investment banking to a holding company role to actually uh, getting my hands dirty but there were excuse me a lot of consulting um alum around me uh, at, at the school and of course the consulting firms spent a lot of time on campus and so i did attend um some of those networking sessions uh but it was it was mainly my second year when i when i actively applied uh to consulting and sort of converted um and, and joined full time uh after my second year my first year i ended up uh interning at a fintech startup uh, in Asia, uh, because again, like ultimately, I think I that's what I wrote about in my business school application, and it was um, my curiosity had been peaked over a period of of four years, having worked in fintech to some degree in banking, and then done a little bit of fintech work and projects uh, at the conglomerate. That I wanted to actually work um, in the insides of of a high growth uh, fintech uh, startup. Uh, and so that's what I did. But then I think I also realized that I wanted to um, spend more time in the U.S. Uh, that was sort of one piece of it. Uh, and the other was to, I think, being at business school and uh, having to uh, analyze and assess uh, real world business problems and, and situations every day for, uh, for school rubbed off on me and i wanted to extend that into the real world um and consulting obviously gives you the opportunity to do that working across functions and across industries and that's another reason why i felt like it would be a great place to uh to start at post business school so how how painful was it to uh prepare for case interviews after having you already had the banking interviews done now all of a sudden you have to learn the case format was it painful or were you able to pick it up pretty fast it was hard uh, it's it's a different uh, muscle it's a diff different approach to uh, expressing what you probably have learned over time um, having spent a few years in the working world um, so i i feel like i had to really hone that skill of cracking the case and, and really doing a good job in a case interview i practiced uh, a, a decent amount uh, with peers of mine with uh, a lot of the uh, the alums who had worked at the the big three consulting firms and then who were at the business school I was at, mm -hmm. um, and and I I kind of focused on um, the uh, the the kind of mock cases that that some of these firms hand out to their their alum and and their current employees when they come to campus. Um, after a while, I kind of stopped uh, practicing cases from the case booklets and and really focused on those ones and repeated them um, on my own time to myself um, or, or just some of those and, and some of the others. Is a lot of like the, the practice so that you just get used to using the frameworks in a certain way? Like, okay, this is like a case sizing problem or this one's a specific profitability or division problem, you know, case and just doing the math by hand, that type of stuff is just getting. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting reps in and you don't necessarily, and that's, that's what I was trying to get at in terms of sort of going back and revisiting some of the cases that you've worked on. Yeah. Like trying to see whether you can repeat those frameworks uh, and do some of that mental math or uh, or some of that brainstorming um, before before your final recommendation in a case. Um, because you know, the the more kind of full cases you do, the the less return on time I feel it is, especially towards you know, the, the latter part of your, of, of your uh, prep period. Nice. So you ended up at a top consulting firm. So tell me how that transition has been to banking to consulting. 
Uh, the hours similar, a little bit, a little bit less probably, but just tell me a little bit about that. Um, and then tell me a little bit about the pay in terms of like it being, you know, it's probably not a pay cut because, but and you're probably getting paid really well at your bulge bracket. Was, was that ever con a consideration of like, oh, the pay isn't going to be as, you know, the bonus isn't as big typically. What was your thought process on that? Yeah. So, uh, there were a couple of questions there. I'll start with the transition. Um, the hours, so it's in some ways going back to the client side uh, of, uh, of the table. And so while the hours are not as crazy as investment banking, you're in a client services business. And uh, to some extent, in some cases, depending on the project that, that you're working on or the practice that you're in, it could be a little unpredictable. There could be some, some ups and downs. But uh, on average, you get your weekends, uh, which is automatically, you know, roughly uh, 15, 20 hours of, of work, perhaps, um, and uh, Fridays uh, can, be, can be light. Um, I have spent most of my time in the private equity practice, which is the more intense uh, of the uh, practices that, that you might find yourself in just given the shorter timelines for these uh, diligence assignments. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it's been uh, a, a really um, rewarding experience because it's allowed me to stay connected to uh, the world of finance and explore some of the more qualitative uh, and you know, strategic aspects to um, investment opportunities, whereas I might have only looked at uh, the valuation and the financial analysis side of them when I was in banking. Um, in terms of the, um, actually, forget what your second question was. Uh, pay, just on pay in terms of like, oh, the pay. Yeah. Yes. So in terms of the pay, uh, I'd already taken a pay cut when I moved from investment banking as a uh, rising associate to uh, uh, the corporate world in India, uh, one, just because of the currency uh, switch and two, because it's going from corporate to, uh, from investment banking to corporate. Um, so, you know, I, I, I already done that once and this was obviously a step up from there. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the pay is, is, is great in consulting um, and uh, I, I feel like I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm really enjoying the work. And so, frankly, the pay was, uh, was secondary to me. I feel like, um, over the course of my my career, uh, hopefully, hopefully I'll be fine. I think you'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's important because I think people get so focused on, you know, the money and what they're saving and all this stuff and the their what they're building versus they are actually enjoying the work they're doing day to day, which I think is, you know, you're spending so many hours a week with your colleagues and with your uh, what you're doing. So you should at least try to enjoy it somewhat. So that's great to hear. So anything else before we call it, uh, any final words of wisdom, you know, looking back at your path and um, that you'd like to share? Because you, you jumped around it quite a bit, countries, cities, industry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, on that point, uh, one little reminder that I give myself all the time or try to is, uh, is always be curious, ABC, uh, and, and always be open. Uh, don't, you know, don't let that, uh, that inner child in you who kind of is always asking the innocent why question or is trying to learn about something different, um, fade away, be open to, to new opportunities um, and uh, the so-called emergent strategy instead of uh, you know, uh, only thinking about your deliberate uh, strategy and, and moves. And the other piece when, when you said sort of moving around uh, and jumping around is oftentimes when you're kind of in um, a super intense environment. Um, you you feel as though uh, you might be getting a low, or uh, you know you're just you you can be overwhelmed by everything that's coming at you in in these hard and intense jobs. And then when you're um, a little more emergent and you look around you and others are are crushing it and seem to have it all figured out and um, have you know, uh, things lined up, more power to them, but I, uh, I guess that's not often the case. And so I just try to remind myself to, to trust the process, 
surround myself with uh, with friends and mentors that remind me of this and and that I'll, I'll do just fine and uh, just fine and that uh, that this too shall pass as they say yeah the, there's a lot of uh, there can be a lot of heartache and mental anguish if you try to compare yourself every uh, two seconds to everyone around you there's always gonna be somebody out there that's getting the job that you potentially wanted or succeeding more making more whatever so i think it's that's really great advice um for those out there to you know look internally are they you know being content with themselves and what they have and being and grateful for what they have um so i think it's great we'll end on that thank you so much for your time and for sharing your wisdom thanks a lot Patrick. and thanks to you my listeners at wall street oasis if you have any suggestions whatsoever please don't hesitate to send them my way patrick at wallstreetoasis.com and until next time